Um, as uh, Tim said, my name is Juliana Reinecke. I'm from um, the University of Warwick. And I have the great pleasure to share this uh, very distinguished panel of experts that we have here today to continue this, um, this discussion. Maybe if I ask um, every one of you to just very briefly introduce yourself and then we can move right into the issues. Um, so I'm start. Joanna Haig. Um, I work at Imperial College London where I'm a professor of atmospheric physics and co-director of the Grantham Institute for Climate Change. I'm Kevin Anderson, Professor of Energy and Climate Change at the University of Manchester and Deputy Director of the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research. And I, in a previous life, I spent 10 years designing and commissioning offshore oil platforms. <laughs> I'm Miles Allen, Professor of Geosystem Science in the Environmental Change Institute, School of Geography and the Environment and Department of Physics of the University of Oxford. Uh, Jimmy Donaghy from the University of Warwick Industrial Relations Department. Not an expert in climate change, but I'm the chair of the UCU side of the JNC and chair of the UCU superannuation working group. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we just have about briefly one hour for this panel discussion. So we just um, structured the discussion along the three themes that we set out in the invitation that was, um, that was sent to you all. And um, then at the end we will have some time for open questions and answers. And in the meantime you have sent in some questions as well that um, I will try to feed into the debate um, as we go along. Um, so, um, yeah, maybe we can just start out very briefly by, or briefly by setting out the general landscape. So we all know that Paris was momentous, the COP21, um, COP21 held in, in Paris. Um, and I just would just like to um, ask the panel in terms of the basic climate science, what does this mean to meet the target? If I can maybe start with you, Joanna, to... Okay, so I won't, I won't give you a lecture on atmospheric physics, but um, the temperature of the globe, as near surface air temperature of the globe, has, has been rising faster than it's risen ever before, such that now it's one degree warmer than it was pre-industrial, that's uh, 1850 or more. And um, we know that that's due to carbon dioxide because two reasons. One, the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere is, is going up very, very fast. It's now higher than it has ever been uh, since, well, perhaps at least three million years ago. And just to put that in context, humans haven't been on the globe for more than 200,000 years. So this is a completely different life on Earth. We know that the carbon dioxide is coming from fossil fuel burning because you can carbon date it and you can see the fraction in the atmosphere that's old. So it's definitely coming from fossil fuels. And this very simple physics of the greenhouse effect, which has been known for 100 years or so longer, um, and that entirely tallies between the increase in carbon dioxide and the uh, increase in temperature. So that basis is, is very well understood. So if we don't stop emitting carbon dioxide, the temperature will carry on rising. And this is now well understood. Um, if we want to stop the temperature rising, we need to stop the CO2 emissions. And the meeting in Paris was how are we going to do that? So um, it was... Uh, all the countries of this United Nations Framework Convention of Climate Change Conference of the Parties, and they meet every year, and it is COP21 because it's um, the 21st meeting, conference. And um, at that meeting, which was quite extraordinary, um, if you, uh, you may remember back to Copenhagen, which was seven years before that, um, in which it was all beefed up in advance, and it was terribly disappointing because nothing was agreed at all. This one was amazing. I mean. It was a historic moment. It was quite <coughs> extraordinary sitting there, listening to the outside, from the outside of the, of the discussions that were going on, um, that they achieved a unanimous decision from 195 countries that we need to limit global temperature rise to below two degrees, and if possible, to to one and a half degrees. Now you might think two degrees doesn't sound very much. You know, what about summer and winter? What about different parts of the globe? Two degrees is nothing. But we got to see that in context. Uh, with a two degree warming, you also get sea level rise. And certain countries will then be submerged or nearly submerged with water with two degrees. Another context you can look at in is, uh, if you think back to the last ice age, global temperatures then were perhaps five or seven degrees colder. So five degrees is a huge amount in terms of climate change. You can see that one or two degrees warmer is, is, is very significant. So the Paris Agreement was um, a fantastic um, event in 195 countries agreeing that we're going to have to stop carbon emissions soon. 
and the, and the, the lower temperature you want to, to stop at, the sooner the stopping has to take place. And perhaps I should hand over to Kevin because he knows more about carbon budgets than I do. By the way, just to say, because we don't have microphones here, so if anybody has problems hearing, just uh, raise your hand and then I will ask the panel members to speak up. Okay, okay. Can, can you hear me clearly in the back? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, but my focus is on the, on the much simpler side of, of trying to say, what, well, look at the, the carbon budgets, that I'll explain those in a second, and say, what do we have to do in terms of reducing our emissions to stay in line with the commitments in Paris? So, as Joe's pointed out, the commitments in Paris are for well below two degrees centigrade, and the well below there, of course, is quite important, um, and ideally to aim for 1.5 degrees centigrade. And the work of Miles, Joe, and others out there have said, showed us very clearly before that what matters in keeping to those temperature thresholds is not some spurious target for 2050 or for 2030, but is the total amount of CO2 um, and indeed other greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide, that we dump in the atmosphere over this century. That's what correlates most closely with the temperature towards the end of the century. So we have, therefore, from the IPCC, another acronym, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change at the UN body that clakes, clakes a lot of the science work that goes on around the globe, and we have, from their latest report in November 2014, we have a very clear set of carbon budgets, the total amount of carbon dioxide that we can dump in the atmosphere if we want to meet our Paris Agreement, for instance, our 1.5 or 2 degrees C temperature rise. Now, the important thing there is you can either meet something with a high chance, or you can meet it with a low chance. If you want a good chance of 2 degrees centigrade, then your budget is much smaller. You can put less CO2 in the atmosphere. If you're happy with a not great chance, you're a bit more of a, a, bit more of a gambler, you can therefore say we'll, have, we'll dump more CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, we aimed in Paris to stay well below 2 degrees C, and ideally go aim for 1.5 degrees C. So that moves us very clearly into the, into the sort of set of carbon budgets that are, that are for a good chance of 2 degrees centigrade. So you then start to look at those carbon budgets, and you then start to look at how much carbon we emit into the atmosphere from our using of e use of energy every year, which is about 36 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide, about 40 billion tonnes of gather all the CO2, into the atmosphere every year from our burning of fossil fuels. You look at the size of the budgets, and you can quite quickly work out, for instance, that, and that when we have these carbon budgets for temperature, we get a bit of a range. There's always a bit of unscientific uncertainty about these things. But within three to 13 years, we will have used up all of the carbon budget for the probabilities, reasonable probabilities, of 1.5 degrees centigrade. So that no longer is a really viable goal. So we're now looking at 2 degrees centigrade. The work I and others have done that says that we're now really aiming at probably an outside chance of 2 degrees C of warming, which will, as the International Energy Agency have said, will have likely have anyway devastating consequences for the planet. So 2 degrees C is probably the best that we can now hope to get for, go for. Um, and then you say, well, what would that mean? What would you have to do? To do that, if you do the basic arithmetic around our emissions and our rates of reductions, that would mean that the poorer parts of the world would have to peak their emissions of carbon dioxide, which have been going up, and still are going up at the moment, the poorer parts of the world. They would have to peak those that reach the top by 2025, and then start to reduce very rapidly thereafter, and be zero emissions from their energy by 2050. And then what would we have to do in the wealthier parts of the world, we'd have to do it a little bit earlier than that, because we have signed up on the basis of equity in Paris, We'd have to basically start our emissions reduction now very rapidly indeed, about three times faster than most economists say is possible with economic growth. And we'd have to be it's virtually zero carbon by about 2035. If you put those two together, you can just hit the outside chance of two degrees centigrade. The only re real way around that, which has been discussed a lot now within the scientific community, is if there are technologies we can use in the future for removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, negative emission technologies. So if you do not believe in the idea of a future technology sucking CO2 out of the air in very large quantities, you are left with a very deep and radical mitigation challenge. And we have to remember in the end, in the end that climate change is an existential problem. Not quite so much for maybe people like us, but for poorer people living in more vulnerable parts of the world who are already struggling to eke out a living in their communities anyway. For them, the climate change that we are causing tonight by having the lights on in their room with no windows is actually going to affect their life very severely. This is an existential problem, and we have that balance between what we can do today or the impacts that other people will suffer from in the future. Thank you very much, Joe and, um, and Kevin. Um, and I suppose the question now is, what is the role of investors like pension funds and like USS to meet this target? And maybe if I can ask uh, Miles to, to comment on, on this point in particular. Sure. 
So I'm a climate scientist, but I've actually been involved uh, for the past couple of years uh, through the Oxford Martin School in an initiative um, to try and ask sort of what can climate science offer the investment community um, in terms of uh, advice for this, this conversation that's increasingly taking place over the risks uh, posed by, by climate change. You may have noticed um, what, one, of the bits, one of the handouts uh, around um, uh, this, this, this little um, uh, handout on uh, what we call the, the Oxford Martin Working Principles for Investment in Fossil Fuels, and I, I, I hope you picked a couple up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'll follow it up with you. Um, but, uh, so so the, the, the context of this was uh, in the build up to Paris, uh, there was a lot of meetings of investors around the Paris uh, meeting. Uh, there, was a, there was a very heavy business involvement in Paris. Um, and uh, Cameron Hepburn, Richard Miller here, if you want more questions about this, give everybody away, Richard, to you uh, ask. And, and myself, uh, uh, two of the people involved in this initiative, uh, Cameron is the third, he's an eminent economist. And um, we were talking to uh, a, a, a very large assembly of uh, climate specialist investors. So these were all the, the people from their companies who, who had the climate brief. Um, and Cameron, as a sort of you know fun starting point, asked the room. Um, so everybody's talking about two degrees, but if we had to reduce, if we had to stabilise temperatures at three degrees, for example, how much do you think we'd have to reduce emissions by? And well, he did a quick vote. I won't embarrass people here by repeating that, but um, of course the correct answer is still 100%. You still have to get emissions to zero, no matter what temperature you're aiming for. Um, but but needless to say, nobody in the room got it right, or virtually nobody in the room got it right. Um, which revealed immediately that you know, the investment, although there's a lot of interest in this issue um, from the investment community, even the ones who are engaged, even the ones who've you know, chosen to come to an evening meeting during a COP about climate change, uh, they're not, they haven't really necessarily understood yet, uh, because it's obviously not the, the specialist top priority of, a, of, of somebody who's a, who's a fund manager, for example, um, haven't necessarily got, got the... Um, the overall, the, the overall uh, 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 scale of the challenge. As, as Kevin points out, you know, and, and Joe pointed out, um, to stabilize the climate, we need to get emissions to zero. It doesn't matter what temperature we're going to end up at. And what determines the temperature we end up is the total amount of carbon we dump in the atmosphere uh, and, uh, in, in the interim. So, um, so what we've sort of come up with so far, appreciating that, that, that we need to keep this as simple as possible, are three asks of investors to ask of the companies they <coughs> own uh, which is, first of all, very simply, at what temperature does that company envisage its activities and the products it sells being net zero, being consistent with uh, net zero carbon emissions? And as Kevin points out, net zero, the net there, could conceal a hidden assumption by the company that somebody somehow will be scrubbing carbon out of the system. But I think one can go on to ask the company, well, who do you think is going to do that scrubbing and who's going to pay for it? And, and that's, that's a, a conversation we think investors should be having uh, with companies they own. Um, second question is, if, if your company has a, uh, uh, if you're committed to 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees, um, what's your strategy for getting there? What do you think your company's going to look for? What, what do you think your company's going to look like uh, in a world that's, uh, uh, that, that's a, in a net zero world? Uh, because, again, uh, both company uh, executives but also investors need to appreciate that that world needs to come pretty soon if we're actually going to meet these, these temperature goals. Um, and the third point, of course, critically, because we want to keep the interest of investors and we understand that investors only really get interested if there's a quantitative metric involved, um, we, we, want to, we want to know what metrics are going to be used to, 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 to measure companies, uh, how companies uh, plan to measure their, their progress towards this, uh, to, to, towards this uh, net zero future. So that's what the, the Oxford Martin Project is all about, and hopefully we'll come back, to the, the, come back to this, but these are how we as academics feel we can help investors engage with the companies they own um, to clarify how those companies are contributing to uh, the problem and its solution. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, can I play this back to, um to, to you, and maybe David, you um, kind of started talking about how you engage with companies. I was wondering if maybe you could give us some concrete example of how you've engaged with companies in the past over climate change in particular. Sure. Um, well, I can give you some recent examples. I, I recently had discussions with. I, I recently had discussions with um, major mining companies, uh, BHP and 
Rio, as I said, we, we hold these companies in our portfolio. They do have thermal coal and usually metallurgical coal as well within their portfolios. And specifically ask them how they were going to deal with the, the targets that came out of the COP, maybe the two degree, but more importantly, the aspiration of 1.5 degree. Um, some of you may know that last year, BHP Billiton published a uh, quite a detailed document looking at scenarios and potential implications of a shift to a low carbon economy for the company. And within that, it focused on the two degree target. Or what does a 1.5 degree target mean for both of those scenarios? With Rio, um, they have not yet published a, such a scenario document, but they will be doing at some point this year or early next year because there's a shareholder resolution against the company asking them to do such. Uh, doing that, uh, you think it's been voted on in the UK, they're now waiting for the Australian version of the company to, to have its vote. But that will go through and they will produce the scenario. One of the issues that both of them came back to me and said is yes, we're looking at this. Um, however, we're waiting for the, the IPCC scenarios that will be coming out in 2017 to work back against as well. So they are both looking at it, um, but they haven't yet come up with any particular position as to what the implications of the 1.5 degree world will be for them. Um, I actually, yeah, I think you have to look at these companies in the whole as well. So they do have thermal coal, but it's actually a relatively small percentage of their business. They have metallurgical coal, which we will still need if we want to have steel. Uh, but they also have, within these large mining conglomerates, um, metals and other materials that will be part of, potentially part of the solution, whether that's copper you need to have in your renewable technologies or your batteries or whatever, or the uranium you might need for nuclear power plants, if that's one of the options that we are likely to need in a lower carbon economy. So when you're looking at mining companies, you don't just look at the coal bit they have, you look at them as, as a whole. And the exposure <coughs> for some of these companies is relatively small. So that's a, a recent example of where we've engaged on, on climate change. Okay. Can I just pick up on one point there? I mean, metallurgical coal um, is, I mean, we, Many, uh, many companies and countries have sort of plans to decarbonize their energy supply. Uh, but the sort of the hard maths of, of zero means you can't use, you can't be venting CO2 into the atmosphere for any purpose. Um, and so when we produce steel in 70 years time, we're gonna have to be doing it in such a way that we don't vent carbon, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, and I guess one of the you know, questions we would love companies to be pressed on is what's their plan? How are they, because investing in the kind of um, uh, process change or technological change that we required to get steel onto a carbon neutral footing, um, that's going to take a long time. Um, and, and if companies are, you know, envisage still producing uh, or, or contributing to steel production in 50 years time, that's going to have to be something they're going to be investing in now. So I mean, one of, the, one of the questions we'd like investors to be asking is, you know, for that section of your company, what's your, what's your plan? Could, to, to quickly provide some that, does that add to that to include cement as well or not? Yeah, yeah. Um, cement is the second most used material on the planet, and the yeah. process emissions are incredibly high from it. So yeah. just cement as well as yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and one of the other discussions we had with particularly one of those large mining companies was around CCS. Yes. Um, and, and they are investing heavily in, in supporting the development of technology. Carbon capture and storage is basically taking carbon emissions from a power station or another source an industrial source, a cement company, and piping it back into the ground and storing it underground where currently you would have gas or something else. So the idea is you take this CO2 that right, would be otherwise going up into the atmosphere, you would then basically put it into the ground so it's stored forever. Um, it's a, an expensive technology, it's very little developed. I think there's one operational in um, Alberta in Canada associated with the oil sands there and companies like Shell have been supporting the development of that and I think there may be another one in the Netherlands that might have been turned down but the reality is it's very difficult to get these, this technology off the ground but if you want to control emissions particularly from heavy emitting um, processes whether it's power generation or cement or steel or others that generate lots of CO2 one way to do that is, is to capture the CO2. Unfortunately, the UK government has just 
taken away the support it had for that. Many companies were working with the government to come up with a, a project to, to basically test the technology, to put the technology in place and to, to build a CCS plant. But in December, uh, around the COP, uh, the UK government decided to withdraw its funding for that project. So that's why policy engagement is important, to make sure that they're made aware that, that having policies in place to support development of CCS, to support onshore wind, to support PV, <coughs> is all essential. Is this a direct point? Yeah. Um, yes, I'm just wondering whether the US has made any representation to the UK government when the uh, carbon capture and storage project was abandoned. No. Okay. <laughs> Maybe they should. I think the companies all did, and they were the ones who were directly associated with the project. But, I mean, it, it, the nominal position of the government is that it's not been abandoned, that it's still open, that, that there's a, a plan is being made. It's being, I don't know what committee it's being shunted around. But I, I don't think it's too late for representations to get made. That if, if, if portfolios are exposed, if, if your portfolio is exposed to the lack of that technology, um, you know, if, if, if USS assets are at risk because we're not developing CCS and we're relying on its availability in 30 years' time, in, or even many fewer years' time potentially, um, to use those assets, um, then we can, you know, we should be, we should, we can still, we can still <coughs> make those representations. I think it's, you know, yeah, over to the table. Mm -hmm. And also point out. Okay, yeah. Bye. Just one question. I mean, if you are asking a question to them, what do you have in mind you want to hear? What is your own timeline? I mean, they respond, they give you a pop up, or oh, I come back when you do another report. So you have to have your own little timeline when you, what is acceptable for you, in my opinion, anyway. Um, considering that we have 15 years left, 20, 30 years left, maybe, if you give it the maximum. Um, so what is acceptable to you, or do you just ask the question, and or do you at the end say, well, if you are not, then, I mean, what, what are you, how, are you, how are you engaging? How do you make them do things rather than just asking the question? It's actually very difficult for us to make companies do things. What we try to do is highlight the risks that they will be facing if they're not addressing a long-term issue like climate change. And as I said before, we provide information back to our portfolio managers where we believe that a company isn't uh, managing that risk well. But we don't set specific targets <coughs> for companies to address these issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, Joanna, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm okay. really um, interested in, and, um, and pleased that you're engaging with policymakers. And I think we should point out that the UK government, in one sense, has led the world with the Climate Change Committee setting carbon budgets into the future in five year um, patches of, of de decreasing emissions. Um, which they uh, become en enshrined in uh, legal um, structures. We've got to get the sixth one through next, but I mean, they're going. So in one sense, the UK government has done a really, really good job, but then they've got this very mixed up message of stopping funds for renewables, stopping insulation in homes, stopping CCS. Which policymakers do you talk to and how do you engage them? So um, our most recent discussion with um, Policymakers was with one of the climate change ministers, where uh, ourselves, another investor, and another organisation met with her um, in the middle of last year, just as they were dropping the um, onshore wind support. So this will be post-election onshore wind support, and also the PV uh, photovoltaic support that they had, had in place in the, in the past. And we did make it clear to them that the signals that they were sending the market were not positive if they wanted more investment in the space. Um, and we've had that discussion with them, and we've also tried to have meetings with uh, a more senior member of government, but had them postponed on three occasions. And this, this was working through the IRGCC, which was a group of investors trying to see uh, a senior member of, of the government for climate change policy, and we, um, just before the COP, they, they dropped us for the third time. So we do try to see policymakers around these issues. Sometimes they don't want to hear what we have to say, therefore um, we don't get the meetings. We have <coughs> met with Treasury in the past, we've met with other departments as well. So we do talk to various policymakers, not only in the UK, we also meet with them in, the, in Europe. We had a meeting in the end of February or beginning of March with the Climate Change Commissioner and other representatives, senior representatives, various other departments, energy 
kind of president of his self, himself, um, not the president, but some of his, his people, to discuss, OK, <coughs> we had the COP agreement. Where does that go from, from here? What policies is the Commission and the EU going to put in place to actually implement the, the outputs of, of the COP in Paris? <coughs> Where can investors help with that? And I think this is an important point. Um, the Commission in particular and the EU get, gets lots of lobbying from companies and particularly their representative bodies for no change. So it's useful for policymakers to hear the voice of investors who want to see that change and want to see a smooth change to the carbon economy rather than nothing, 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 bang, we need to do this now. So that's the role we play in our engagement with policymakers, trying to encourage that smooth transition. And just to finish off on this one, hand up there. Um, uh, we're also going to be meeting with the Commission, with the um, Climate Change Commission and other representatives, various other commissions in July of this year to continue those discussions. So it's not a one-off, we do continue to talk to policymakers. Mm. Okay, Kevin, you have a question? Well, just quickly, um, in terms of CCS, the Norway has uh, an industrial level, has been using yes, it um, offshore for well, well over a decade now. So that in a sense, the technology has been tested at the industrial scale on, I can't remember platform it is now. You know, which Schleitner. Schleitner, that's right, yeah. Schleitner. So on the Schleitner field, has been used for a long time. Um, and actually, it was incentivized by, effectively, by a carbon tax. Um, I just think the, the UK position, of, um, I, I, I think, as Joe says, it's very heartening to see the UK actually has carbon budgets. But it is also worth bearing in mind, and to always remind ourselves here, the UK's carbon budgets are for a very low chance of two degrees centigrade. <laughs> As they admit themselves, the Committee on Climate Change, they give the advice to government which budgets to use, they're for a 63% chance of exceeding 2 degrees centigrade, and they take almost no account of equity at a global level. So their assumption is still that uh, the average British person in 2049 will still be consuming more CO or emitting more CO2 than the average person around the planet, and certainly the average person in the poorer parts of the world. Um, the final bit, come back to 1.5, I don't think you have to wait for the IPCC here. Um, the the 1.5 degrees C, uh, the budgets for that are in Table 2.2 of the synthesis report from the IPCC in, in 2014. Those budgets are good enough to be working with. Now, and they give you and they give you the clear range. So you can just start to say, well, what would this, this mean? If we have to start to play out the spirit of these budgets in our portfolio, what would that mean for those you know, that investments in those sorts of assets? Now, you could, you could go further and say, say, well, okay, that looks very challenging. Let's imagine a scenario where we, we did assume certain levels of negative emission technologies. We don't, uh, wouldn't allow you to do quantitative analysis with those existing budgets. You don't have to wait for the IPCC, which will be another, well, you can measure things in time. Why well, to measure it? It'll be another 100 billion tonnes from now, probably when the IPCC report on there. And the next, the next 1.5 degrees C report. Okay, that was a hand up there. Yeah, um, it strikes me when you talk about engaging with policymakers in government or whatever, that that's, this is an area that perhaps you could uh, work together with your members, maybe either directly or, via, or with UCU, if, if a combined pressure of you guys in the suits and uh, <laughs> members, many of whom are probably retired and very intelligent with a quite a bit of time on their hands, um, <laughs> you know, that bet between us all, we might be able to make those things go the right way rather than the wrong way. Can I just follow up on that? Perhaps, perhaps it's for, for Bill and Roger as much as um, if we could sort of spread the questions around. But I mean, to what extent is the scope for investors coordinating your ask of both companies and governments? Because I mean, um, you, you're quite a, you're a top fifty investor yourselves, but. Um, you know, it, it seems it seems to me there's a sort of classic um, game theory problem here that what's in the collective interest of all investors may not be in the individual interest of any individual investor, and so there's a need for coordination uh, across investors in this whole space. And, and uh, I, I think we do. So I, I don't think in this space where we're th talking about longer term risks to which uh, the economy as a whole is exposed, that there's any fear of either being accused of kind of cartel behaviour or indeed of us trying to game these issues against other investors. And this is an area where we have worked very closely with some of the other major UK investors in particular, okay, like railways, yeah. pension scheme, for example. Yeah, I'm happy to, to, to provide more colour on that. When we set up the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change in 2001, it was very clear at that point that policy engagement had to be a key part of that. And uh, we're still heavily involved in, 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 in 
coordinating the activities of, of that group and working, um, I advise the board in, in terms of, uh, of developing what its strategy is going to be. Um, that group is one that we frequently engage together with and that we work with Railpen, we work with uh, other UK pension funds, we work with the big Dutch pension funds, um, the big Scandinavian pension funds. We all, particularly in a European context, sometimes the UK voice isn't one that's heard very loudly for lots of reasons. So engaging with, with other European funds is critical in getting that, that message across. This is all investors, it isn't just um, it isn't just the UK or just the Dutch. The, I think the other thing is that actually going into pension funds as well as asset managers, pension funds we represent across well, particularly the Dutch funds who have <coughs> millions of members. We have 350,000 members. The BT scheme had 350,000 members. Pension funds tend to have a lot of uh, members which is, is, who are voters. So when you're talking to policy makers, that's actually quite a, a strong message to get across. Mm -hmm. So we do very seriously, and just, we take that global as well. Um, uh, the, the, the various investor groups that there are has formed, the investor climate change groups, have formed a, a central group to coordinate policy activity there as well. So when we provide a statement for the COP, that's pulling in the big, the big US funds, the big Australian funds, New Zealand, a, a very small number of active uh, emerging market pension funds as well. So it's sending a message from investors around the world that we that this is an issue that the governments need to address. So absolutely, we work with other investors to make sure that the voice is heard across. Mm. Okay, um, thank you very much, David. So you said from po policy is one of the three areas of responsible investment that you outlined. If I just come back to the management of the portfolio, because a number of questions um, have been submitted by, by members in advance. And um, a number of those um, were about um, the Asset Owners Disclosure Project, which um, assesses um, the world's largest investors in terms of their climate risk management. And so USS has, um, in the latest edition of, of those, fallen by 66 places to number 82. And so um, Robin Saunders asked the question, there were a number of questions on this, I just picked this one out. What aspect of the investment policy of USS has resulted in such a dramatic fall in its annual ranking of climate risk management? If you could uh, just explain to Sorry, the members the what's to use. What's Nothing that we have done has changed our ranking. So we have, uh, so the asset owner disclosure project is, 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 for those of you who don't know, is a, an NGO that started in Australia assessing the Australian super fund in terms of the climate change activities, um, the climate change disclosure activities, and uh, is now based in London and uh, surveys um, about a thousand pension funds, asset managers, sovereign wealth funds on how they're dealing with climate change. Uh, they sent out a survey of which I've got a copy of <coughs> in my bag, I was going to wave it because it's in my bag, but it, it's it's a very detailed, very onerous survey that would take us an inordinate amount of time to complete. So USS took a decision early on in the, in, in the development of the ODP that we would not complete the survey. What we would do is we try to be transparent in what we do in terms of climate change and put more information on our website about how we're addressing climate change risks than any other UK pension fund. We, 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 are, we disclose what we do. Uh, as much as we can. We provide information <coughs> to our members. Rather than filling in a questionnaire that goes to an NGO who then ranks you on it. So, our scores have been, I think there have been four of them. I think it was 82, 86, 16 last year. And I must say, nobody commented on the fact that we went from 80 <laughs> to 16. And this year it's gone back up to 82. And I've asked for the reasons as to why, and the generic reasons are, They've moved away from understanding what you're disclosing to understanding more about the sorts of investments you're making and the people have moved around us. Um, I want to give a bit more information about the asset and the disclosure project. So we've not changed anything that we do, the process has changed around us. And I have to say that I would rather spend time engaging with companies 
engaging with policy makers, helping my portfolio managers integrate ESG issues into their investment processes, than spending days filling out the survey. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to raise a point of financial interest. Now, uh, Bloomberg has various times uh, reported that energy companies, especially the shale drills, have lost an enormous amount of money and that they're heavily indebted. Now, uh, at the start of this year, four energy companies had to, were investing in uh, renewables. And I see that the OSS has invested in Shell and in BP. Perhaps others I don't know. Um, now, as far as I know, they are not among the companies that invested in um, renewables. So, how safe is it for our money to be invested in at least two energy companies if they have lost that? Uh, can I just, on, on one particular point, both BP and Shell do have very large renewable businesses embedded within them. They don't talk about it very much, they don't draw out the financials, but both of them have multi-billion pound uh, uh, biofuel businesses. So they, they, they take plants and convert that to, to, to fuel. So they, they are involved in renewable, and BP used to have a bigger renewable business, uh, but it sold it off. But they do have very big biofuel businesses, yeah, bio as does Total. Is that biofuels from oil from uh, it's from plants? It's from plants. That's what caused Indonesia to become the third largest emitter because of the demand for palm oil. Not f largely not for biofuels, largely for other. That's the subject my documentation has. No, BP had I think BP did go from there beyond the petroleum <laughs> phase, which is yeah. which cost a fortune just to rebadge it, and, it, and then it, and then it pulled back from its renewables yeah. portfolio, except for the, for the bio one, and that's partly because it it, rec it knows how to do the bio one. It looks like what they've been doing for the last hundred years, as the other ones that they they, they pulled back from. So I think both BP and Shell have not had a particularly good record in trying to to move their portfolio from hydrocarbons to um, to renewables, to genuine renewables, not you know, not the biofuel. Can I push back to the question here, though, on, on the risk um, and, and why, where you see the risks here? We've got a bit diverted on biofuels there. Yeah, okay, so I, I think the uh, question is that all energy production has suffered, um, and it's largely because oil price has fallen from a peak of almost $150 to somewhere um, 40 to $45 uh, at the moment. Um, and you know, that has hurt renewable energy um, businesses and it's hurt uh, traditional um, sort of hydrocarbon uh, businesses. So uh, being underweight uh, energy, as our portfolio has been, has been a good thing uh, to, to have done, um, certainly in this uh, period of time. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think we probably assess that there are certainly risks and there are certainly reward potentials somewhere in the energy sector. Um, and uh, that's a determination we make sort of on an ongoing basis. Yeah, the debt um, stood at fully $235 billion at the end of March 2015. Now it can't have gone uh, and up. I mean, it can't have been restored in that time because the uh, price I think if you, if you just stay on this issue of um, BP, which is very interesting because there was a shareholder resolution in 2015 which USS um, supported, which we think is very positive, basically to um, disclose additional information on climate risk and strategic resilience um, of uh, BP. Now there are um, annual general meetings coming out of Exxon and Chevron 
And we're just wondering what would use USS voting position be on, on the similar issue here? Would you support, would you be willing to support these um, resolutions again? So last year we supported both the BP and Shell mm -hmm. shareholder resolutions and we voted for those. This year we have also uh, co-filed the, share, the same shareholder resolutions with Anglo-American and Rio Tinto. We didn't co-file with Glencore because we don't hold it in our elected full company. Um, with respect to Exxon and Chevron, we don't actually hold Chevron, so we can't vote it. Uh, with Exxon, the annual generating is in about three weeks' time, I think, the 25th. Uh, we haven't voted it yet, but we have already pre-disclosed that we will be supporting at least two of the, the, the two that we can pre-disclose on, which is one on lobbying, and one on the scenario side, uh, policy side. We haven't looked at the other two resolutions that are climate change related ones that Exxon is facing. Are you going to look at them? Well, we will do. I, mean, okay. I can't say how we're going yep. to vote them, but, the, the, but we have a process we go through <laughs> with all the, all the resolutions we look at, we individually assess them, and we will, we will vote them. We vote all of our holdings globally, or occasionally it doesn't, doesn't happen, but we aim to vote all our, and we do it internally. So when you hear about investors that, that sign up to a service provider and basically someone else votes for them, we vote our own company, we don't use someone else. And someone, a couple of people in my team are working full time now just on voting. Okay. Kevin, just, just to notice that BHP were also, Broken Hill Children were also one of your companies that you have assets. So BHP? BHP. So BHP didn't get the shareholder resolution because it published its scenario work last year, so they didn't receive the Okay. Okay. Um, just uh, just being conscious of time, and um, we come back. And we have a little bit more time on uh, for questions later. Um, so um, we've talked about policy engagement um, and engagement with companies. Um, we now move a little bit to the question of material change in the portfolio. Um, and maybe if Kevin, you can um, read us on on this topic of what what is it that we would like to see in you know in, in our investment portfolio to um, you know tackle um, well I'm, I'm starting to stray yeah. quite far outside my area of expertise here but then um, my understanding is that you've got people like the environment agency that their pension fund that they they um, have a reasonable chunk, I think something about a quarter of their investments are in things that are badge low carbon. Now quite what that badge means is a different matter. And that they're one of the leading, if one of the, if not the leading pension organization to be doing this. And I was wondering whether USS would would be would consider at least matching that. I mean I would argue that probably 25% is, is not the best, it's the least worst. Um, trying to at least match that, if not maybe to some social leadership and go beyond that in terms of trying to get an asset portfolio that had a had a higher proportion of badged low carbon um, investments. Now quite I say what low carbon means, I think is something we have to be analyze in a bit more detail. So I suppose the starting point for, for <coughs> answering that question goes back to what I was explaining earlier about our um, understanding of the fiduciary legal framework in which we operate in. So that the first lens <coughs> that we look at our investment portfolio has to be on the financial return to our beneficiaries. And the only way that we could end up with a portfolio construction like that would be from first principles if our view was that that was likely to, amongst all other potential portfolios that we could invest in, produce the best financial returns for our members. Right. Can, can I come back on, on that point? Because actually, about, uh, something I was thinking about earlier when you were talking about it, uh, you got to give this, this return on financial investment. We've had Paris, we've had climate change science since, well, since the early 1800s, to be honest. Um, uh, so, and what we're very clear is we don't reduce emissions, we get impacts. So when you have this idea that you have to get a return on financial investment for the members, for people like us in the future, if you can demonstrate now you get a financial return, but that financial return destroys the environment at such a level, when I get to be my retirement age, which is really not that far away, it's very depressing, and when I get to retirement age, the climate has been damaged to such a level that my financial situation is much worse because of the investments that USS made on my behalf 20 years beforehand. How does that factor, I mean, both of those are financial, your finance, your, your sense of financial benefits to its members, as a member, I would like to know when I retire, 
Not only has the immediate return on the investment done well, but actually the climate hasn't been reduced to such a level, destroyed to such a level, that my financial wherewithal is actually worse. So I've got, I've got 30 pounds off the investment, but I've got 50 pounds worth of in impacts. Um, how do you reconcile those? So, so those are material. Those are, those, those are all material considerations. Oh. And I don't know what you want to come in, but yeah. I, mean, I would say that the, 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 um, the, 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 the further out, the more difficult they are to assess. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they are not uh, issues that are relevant to investment decision making, because if they have financial consequences, we can and should take them into account. But Roger? Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, we have a pretty long-term frame of reference for an asset manager. Um, we have five-year sort of performance review periods. Um, I'd like that to be longer, uh, and then you know, these things play out more fully. But I'd say that we're not in the short term as uh, business. So um, you know, um, we haven't developed <coughs> today the conviction that the highest returns that we will be able to achieve for the fund will be through a particularly you know, um, top-down, low-carbon portfolio. Uh, we are doing quite a lot of work on the theme of carbon. I think it's sort of like the theme of the, the year um, uh, in our fund <laughs> in terms of um, the measurement of our carbon exposures and moving on and looking at the risk that those carbon exposures present. Um, speak up excuse this, me. Yeah. <coughs> um, so uh, the, um, yeah, I mean, the issue that you're posing is if society goes off a cliff, um, uh, that would be a very bad thing for all of us um, and uh, in a way the question that we're posed is will we end up being a meter higher off the floor than you know, the rest of the financial community um, and I think we rely on governments a great deal to get the world not going off the cliff and I think the, the, the policy framework of this is very important and it's beyond our means the fact that we might you know, divest may, let's, uh, let's imagine that deteriorated financial return, that wouldn't have helped the scheme anyway. The world's still going over the cliff. We'll just end up a meter lower after that. Can, can, I, can I chip on this? Because you mentioned um, uh, uh, earlier on that only about half of your portfolio, if I'm right, is in equities and these sort of com traded companies. So, so, so when you're making a, a, a real estate deal or, 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 or buying some sort of long-term infrastructure asset, um, uh, do you have a do you have a price of carbon that I mean, most most assets um, have w the, 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 the the asset will generate carbon and, and many companies when they're making investments like that use a, a, a shadow price of carbon um, and so do, do you have one and, and uh, is it is it public is it uh, forgive me if it's on the website already I, I uh, no I don't think it is um, public certainly every uh, sort of private market investment we make so infrastructure and property uh, would be a caption that will have an environmental element of study or a responsible investment piece of the investment thesis. Um, so that's sort of where it comes into the investment uh, case. So but can I add on? Because I do that bit of due diligence mm -hmm. and oversee that for the scheme in, in the private market stuff. Uh, we also do it in, in our real estate portfolio. We don't have a price of carbon, but the types of assets we're buying in our, in our uh, our um, infrastructure, for example, are, are not going to be generating energy unless it's within our municipal portfolio. But, but it's uh, it's more we have uh, the exposure to railways, we have a port, we have uh, uh, national air traffic control. Um, so we have some that are impacted by climate change. And part of your due diligence is to ask, okay, what if something comes along? What what are the like what are the likely implications? of a higher carbon price, is that likely to impact the asset over the time frame that we're likely to hold it? So we do ask those those questions. Or is sea level going to rise for the port? We, did, we had this discussion. Is sea level going to rise, rise at the port that we have in the US to such an extent that it won't be operable? So we do ask those questions when we're doing, doing, looking at the assets we buy. It sounds, Miles, that you would like and I would like very much that we knew enough about our carbon exposure and could run you know, 
generational sort of growth over many years, um, uh, carbon price scenarios and assess the risk. I wouldn't say that we've achieved that state of technology, but aspirationally, we certainly are heading in that direction. Got a number of questions, Tom. I think you had your hand up for some time. Yeah. Uh, hello again. I'm, I'm not going to ask a nasty legal question this time. Um, it's, it's a genuine question for, for David Rossman. Um, so uh, I, I think everyone is sort of pretty clear that USS is definitely one of the best investors, the most transparent and everything. Um, but my question was specifically about shareholder resolutions. Uh, so you, you mentioned, we've mentioned these a number of times, and you'd said that um, a lot of shareholder resolutions on the environment, particularly coming from the states, um, I'm just uh, ge ge genuinely interested to know, have we got a policy at USS for putting forward our own resolutions? Um, what we need to do to have a shareholder resolution, you've either, either got to have 5% of the votes in a, in a company, 5% uh, of the voting rights in a company, or you've got to organize with 100 shareholders. Um, so so and, and that can be a much smaller percentage, but I'm just very, very interested to know if we've got a policy in it. So we don't have a specific policy for putting in shareholder resolutions. We don't have a policy against doing it, hence what last year we did, well, it would have been this year's voting, we did, we co-filed the resolutions on, um, sorry, can you hear me? the resolutions on Anglo and Rio. Uh, we also did a shareholder resolution in France last year against Orange on particular governance related issues. You, in the UK, shareholder resolutions are rare because we tend to have good access to both management and the board of companies. The reason why you have shareholder resolutions in the US mm. is because, to put it bluntly, shareholders have zero power. All shareholder resolutions are advisory. So even if you get 90% vote of the shareholders against the shareholder resolution, against management, management just don't have to take any notice. So it's a very different culture out there. Um, the culture of access to management, access to boards is, is very limited. It's beginning to change. but. It's very difficult to talk to board members who are our representatives at the company, after all, in the US. So, it, it, so it's a different culture. There are very few shareholder resolutions. I can think of half a dozen shareholder resolutions in the UK in the 15 years that I've been at USS. It just doesn't happen very often. USS. That's in the US. US. No, in the UK, there are very few shareholder resolutions. Okay, yeah, just in the back. No, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, for, for your um, default defined contribution fund in particular, but also the growth fund and any defined contribution fund, would you assess commit to having uh, an ethical alternative or an alternative that screens out high carbon companies um, and charges the same investment management charge as in particular the default fund? So that it's basically just a subset of it default fund or screens out high carbon companies without charging people extra to even ask uh, um, share action to tell you which companies to screen out so, you, so, so it doesn't cost them more, if your own people more money. <coughs> so they, you know, if, if people have an alternative to the default fund, which doesn't involve an increase in investment management charges, then um, I think that might actually be quite a um, an attractive option for our people. Of course, they have to realize that there, there may be the risk that we'll get less returns, and then we could eventually have a fair amount of information about the uh, returns on the default fund versus that subset of the default fund. So, we've done a lot of work in this space, as, as I think you probably expect that we would. We've surveyed membership. We've got, uh, I think, what we consider a very clear mandate from a very high proportion of people who responded on their concerns in the ethical <coughs> investment space. Uh, and we have taken that mandate and we've gone to the um, external market looking at what's available. Um, I think we need to say in the first place we will not be managing the individual funds in the final contribution pension scheme in-house in USS in the first instance. We'll be doing largely the asset allocation work but because we're set up to be a defined benefit fund manager, it will take us some time uh, to uh, put the infrastructure in place to manage funds that have to be priced, for example, on a daily basis and have that level of liquidity. So the initial fund management for the um, DC funds will be 
external fund managers, with some asset allocation being done internally by Roger and his team. In order to, so, so we got what we felt was a very, very robust mandate from the members about the ethical component of the, uh, of the self-select funds that we put on the platform. And when we went out to the marketplace, we found that um, actually there were few enough funds that would actually fulfill the, the, the requirements that USS members wanted to play. So we will, and we will be um, in, um, in June publishing the investment guide in advance of July giving members the opportunity to select between these two funds. We'll be explaining how we've interpreted that mandate and what we are looking to put in place is a lifestyle arrangement with an ethical uh, uh, theme such that members who want to choose an ethical fund in the default, fund, in the defined contributions base, will be able to have a lifestyle approach as per the default fund that we will be putting people into as normal. Um, so I could talk for that. I could talk about that for, for some time. I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm missing any no, fees. Uh, oh, the fees. Yes, of course. So also the ethical alternative to the growth fund that was, that was mentioned earlier. Are you, are you still going to be doing that? Yes. Yes, so, so very briefly on fees, uh, in, in USS, as you may know, the um, employers and through the JMC, the other stakeholders have agreed that the fund, uh, the, the fund management fees will be subsidized up to a certain threshold that we don't expect to reach for some considerable number of years. Uh, uh, and to the extent that people choose a self-select fund from the self-select range, the equivalent amount of subsidy will be applied. Now we are currently working through the last elements of pricing up what the uh, cost of funds in the self-select range are. Uh, and uh, all, all we can say at the moment is, if they cost the same or less than the default fund, the default strategy, then there will be a full subsidy on them. Uh, we'll have to look at uh, the extent to which we're able to deliver on that, and that's what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And an ethical alternative to the growth fund, which was mentioned earlier, are we still committed to that? Yeah, absolutely, we have an ethical alternative to the growth fund. I think, um, I think most members will be very pleased to hear, but just to keep in mind, to find contribution that's for the earnings above 55,000 pounds, just to just to clarify. And 1% more more match. Or if people, yes, and choose to put in yeah. as much as they yeah. like, the first 1% of their salary will be matched by the employer as well. Okay, great. Um, so just, I wanted just to pick up on this question that was around um, the engagement with members. And um, uh, and I think this is, a, as Tim said in the beginning, a very kind of significant moment for us that you agreed to meet with us um, uh, in this type of format. Um, and so I think um, it, it seems there's really genuine interest in you know, greater engagement with our pension fund, knowing what's going on, um, and maybe also you know, helping to shape some of these policies, tapping into the expertise that, that's really in the room and you know, amongst the membership. Um, so I just wanted to turn to Jimmy, who is the chair of the UCU side of the Joint Negotiation Committee, and um, maybe you could explain to us just briefly you know, why is it important that USS engages with its members? Well, I suppose, um, first of all, that UCU represents all members of the scheme rather than just UCU members within the scheme. That's an important point to make. But, uh, so we're the sole official member representative through the governance structure. But in addition to that, we've been pushing for the last number of years along with Chair Action that we believe there's a necessity to do something like a member survey around these issues. And while we recognise the survey about the DC design engage with issues like that, I think, you know, Bill, that we would rather there would be a proper survey covering the whole scheme around these issues. Um, so I suppose there's really two questions emerging from that. And the first is, are we going to see a survey like we've been asking for for the last number of years? And secondly, uh, will USS come back to do a similar meeting with members, for example, on an annual basis, <coughs> in addition to the governance structures that we already have with the member directors and the JNC, etc.? 
So time changing. I come back on both of those, those separately. So, so over the past uh, two years, I think it is, um, uh, we have uh, consulted all the members on the scheme change program that we're working through. Uh, we have <laughs> launched a, a, a survey with all of the members on the structure of the defined <coughs> contribution piece. In, with members now, there is a, uh, a survey that we've got looking for um, the levels of awareness of the changes that are happening, people's understanding of what they're going to have to do to engage with them, such that we can track the effectiveness of our communications about these things over time. And that's going to be a, a regular kind of drumbeat survey as we go through these changes so that we can get a feel for if we need to change our communications. And we have also uh, agreed that we will survey all of the members on an annual basis about all the issues that uh, they, they believe will be relevant, including and, 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 and substantially uh, issues in relation to ethical investment, because that is important to us, as I hope you see, uh, and, 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 and it's important that we understand members' positions on these. I, I have to say the reason that it hasn't happened, and I know uh, Professor Valentine and, and others will have said, why well, you know, you've, you've undertaken to do this for some time. But I hope you understand that the, the breadth and, 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 and amount of the work that we're doing with members to try to get this new scheme design up and off the ground is quite substantial. Um, as we, are, we have an agency engaged in designing this with us now. We, we can't put it into uh, members uh, while the big changes are happening over the summertime. But in the autumn time, we will be surveying members with this broader perspective. And will you come to UCU with the design to comment on it before put out to members? Uh, I think we have undertaken to, to, to go and have uh, a, a discussion about it. I mean, what, what we will, of course, do is have uh, an independent uh, 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 research advising us on how to make sure that the answers are robust and, and, and comparable to others and, and, and statistically. Uh, sound and all of that. Um, we also have, uh, we're also trying to reach out quite substantially to members, uh, particularly active members in institutions and indeed through the process of scheme changes going on we will have, uh, we're bolstering our work running seminars and engagement workshops in institutions uh, with more people uh, to go and talk to members about yes what's happening in scheme changes how people should understand them, what they might want to do to respond to them, and also pick up on other issues that members want to, to raise. So, so in an institution near you, over the coming months, there will be um, <coughs> seminars and workshops in, in working with the institutional administrators. So there's a weight of, 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 of stuff going on. I am always, I mean, I find events like this hugely helpful beneficial. I think it's a, hopefully it's a two-way um, uh, sharing of information and, and learning space. And I would be happy to do that. And, and I think I speak on behalf of all the executive to come to these events, these type of events and share. My personal view is I think they are more valuable than they are on issues like this. You know, we've had two hours. Uh, we haven't even got close to unpacking this particular issue. I have to say my concern about a broader of come all ye type event is that it you, you, you just won't even get to deal with um, uh, any issue in reasonable depth. So, so what I would say is, I'm happy to turn up at events. I think I prefer if there are events where we can deal substantively with issues like this one, and I think that might be a template for, 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 for a way forward. Okay, that's one that's really wonderful to hear. So, I think uh, most of you will agree. Um, so, we have a few just minutes left for, for just open questions, um, and uh, yeah, some of you have been on the link here and stuff. So, yeah. Thank you very much. I, I want to echo those comments. It's so fantastic to have this opportunity to, to engage with you. I think that's fantastic. And I also particularly love the hard work that went into helping make this happen behind the scenes, you can see, and also the share actions with particularly George and Jamie. So, some thanks there. So I just want to um, unpack a comment, um, Mr. Gavin, that you made um, in your presentation, which was this. The question, and I'm loosely quoting you, the question is not how USS 
can um, decrease global climate change. The question is, in the context of material risk to financial investments, what is the appropriate response? I just want to unpack that for the moment, because it seems to um, uh, uh, disclose a certain conceptual um, mindset, which I think needs to be addressed head on if we're actually going to, to move forward at all. So um, the first thing I want to do is just um, reassure you that um, since the Paris Agreement clearly includes and indeed mandates non-party stakeholders and particularly explicitly investors and those in the private finance sector to work with governments to reduce uh, global greenhouse gas emissions, it is actually your responsibility. I'm going to reassure you about that. Um, in also, um, Roger, I think, picked up that point that really you're looking to policy makers to tell you what to do. There's that sense that, that if it's not happening at the policy level, then you are acting on your own. You are literally one metre above or below the rest <coughs> of the financial sector. But policy makers have spoken, and they spoke at Paris, and they've spoken at the national level too. And what they've said is we need to live in a world that is well below two degrees. So that plus the um, explicit mandate in the Paris Agreement that um, non-party stakeholders, particularly investors, need to help that to happen, puts it in your world. So that's a reassurance. The second thing is there is a question um, on that first part of your, um, sorry, second part of your statement, Bill, which is the understanding of climate risk as a financial risk. And in fact, Financial Stability Board and Bank of England just recently, in the last 12 months, and particularly a lot of activity on this issue in the last month, have stated pretty clearly that climate change risk is in fact a financial risk, which puts it out of the ESG, the usual ESG ethical bag, and into its and, and into the financial bag. So um, that notion, spoken by some really very serious players in the finance circuit, that climate related risk is finance risk, means that that question that you posed but didn't answer, um, <coughs> Mr. Galvin in the context of material risk to financial investment, what is the appropriate response, needs an answer. Do you feel you have an answer? And if you don't feel you have an answer, what information do you think you need to be able to give it? Very hard to, uh, I think I probably got in before you though on that one saying that, uh, acknowledging that climate change risk is a financial issue and something that we take as I hope you've seen very seriously. It is relevant to the decision making that we make about how to generate the best investment returns for our members and, and, and we try to explain how we factor that in. So so just to, just to be clear on that, in relation to your next point, I was saying, when I, when I made those comments, I was saying, so the primary lens with, through which we need to view our investment decision making process is one of looking to get the best financial returns from our members. And the primary lens is not how can we reduce the risk of climate change overall. However, clearly, the risks of climate change, the risks of individual, that individual companies are exposed to either climate change or the policy or consumer decision making that responds to the risk of climate change is something that we take very seriously and factor in to our individual decision-making processes. And indeed, as Roger outlined earlier, the overall exposure of USS's portfolio to the risks of climate change or to the policy or consumer risk of responding to, to, to climate change is something that we're working very hard to understand. So I hope we can put your mind at risk. What I, when I made those comments, I was referring to our legal and fiduciary responsibilities about the primary lens through which we need to look when we're making our investment decisions. Okay, I think there are a number of questions still out there mm -hmm. and as, um, as Bill said, we have only been able to scratch the surface of this very, very complex topic. Um, but just, um, um, just in the interest of, uh, of time, I, I'm afraid we have to kind of close this uh, 
this panel discussion, but I really, really wanted to thank Bill, Roger, and David to come here today and to engage with, with, with us, with members. And I think what we've seen today is that there's, of course, a real issue in, in climate change, but also a real issue in engaging with USS, our pension fund, to know more about, to have the chance to input into how the investment decisions are made. Um, and I really hope this is the beginning of um, ongoing engagement um, between the membership and USS. And I also just want to thank the panel a lot for coming here and contributing um, and really kind of um, bringing some of these issues to light, which are so complex. And um, yeah, so just to say, if you're interested in joining us, we've booked a space um, in the Jeremy Bentham pub just around the corner. So in an informal setting, we can just continue the debate. If you're interested in becoming more involved into the Listen to USS campaign on these issues, just please come along and join us for a drink. Okay, thank you very, very much.